بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه وصلاة والسلام على رسول الله when the Muslims believed in the revelation so many of the Quraysh began to persecute them and we heard about the persecution of the very first martyr Sumayya رضي الله عنها from our beloved state of Husayna and there were other men and women who were persecuted for example Um Shuraik رضي الله عنها she and her husband accepted Islam and when her husband was away her in-laws came and they asked her whether or not she had actually converted and when she affirmed her in-laws carried her out of her home on their shoulders basic, basically kidnapped her took her and force fed her bread and honey and then would not allow her to have any water so you can imagine how dry her mouth felt and her throat and then they left her in the desert sun for three days and when they did so and they came back three days later she had lost her sight and they asked her does she still believe in Allah does she still believe that there's only one God and the way that she responded was still one finger up to the sky in affirmation of this belief this persecution was so intense that we know that there was a migration from Mecca to Abyssinia. And we also likely have heard of when the Muslims stood in front of a Najashi and Ja'far, radiallahu anhu, the son of Abu Talib, stood and responded to an Najashi's questions on why they were here because the Quraysh had sent people to follow them to Abyssinia to get them back. And when Ja'far, radiallahu anhu, stood, and he explained how the Prophet ﷺ took them from the darknesses to the light. The way that they used to harm people and hurt people and didn't take their responsibilities towards people seriously. And then he recited the beginning of Surah Maryam. He said, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ذكر رحمة ربك عبده زكريا إذ نادى ربه نداء خفيا قال رب أنا يكون قال رب أن قال رب أن thank you جزاكم الله خيرا can you say it to me again قال رب إني وهن العظم مني واشتعل رأس شيبا ولم أكن بدعائك رب شقيا وإني خفت الموالي من ورائي وكانت امرأتي عاقرا فهب لي he continued to recite the surah as Um Salama explained. The narrator of this hadith is Um Salama radiallahu anha. Have you heard of this narration before? This incident? Have you heard of Ja'far radiallahu anhu going to Abyssinia and speaking in front of a Najashi? Did you know that Um Salama is the one who narrated it? A woman was the one who told us of this incident and we wouldn't have known about it if she hadn't. And with Ja'far and the Muslims in Abyssinia were over 20 women who had migrated from Mecca to Abyssinia. Some of them didn't have any, any animal to ride on because they couldn't afford it. So walking and riding on animals, they went through the desert onto a ship. None of them had gone on a ship before. Now they're going on ship, they're going to Abyssinia, and this is where they stay for some time. Asma Ziada, who is a scholar who wrote the book, The, the, political, role, the political Roles of Women in the Time of the Prophet وسلم, and the Righteous Khulafa, she speaks about how when she did research on more contemporary historians, when we look at the narrations that they include, they include narrations like Ja'far radiallahu anhu speaking. They speak about his life radiallahu anhu. But it's not simply that they mention, for example, and his wife, but don't mention the name. 
It's that they simply don't mention women at all. And that this is such a stark contrast from the earlier books of history, like Ibn Sa'd's Al-Tabaqat or Ibn Hajr or, um, or uh, Ibn Hisham, that these books talk about the roles of women and the presence of women and the way that women impacted society. And yet, over time, that's shifted. So that many of us today maybe have asked, where really have been women in Islamic society? What are really women's roles or contributions? Especially when we keep hearing that there's really only one role that women play in our community. And this isn't to say that all history books right now omit women or that they were intentional in doing so. But the point is there's been a shift of culture even in the books that have been written. And so when a young woman like myself when I was younger, like many of you when you've been younger or maybe now, are going to the masjid and you're not hearing about any of the women companions, sometimes we wonder, well, did they even exist? I remember feeling so connected to Khalid ibn Walid عنه, fighting battles on behalf of the Prophet وسلم, for the Izza of Islam. Or Bilal radiallahu anhu and he would give the adhan in the powerful way that he would give the adhan. Or Ibn Abbas and how he knew the tafsir of the Quran and I felt so connected to all of these companions. Radiallahu anhu. But when I would hear Aisha radiallahu anha or Khadija radiallahu anha or Fatima radiallahu anha, of course I knew, I believed in the, 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 in the immense iman and the sacrifices of these women. But did I feel connected to them? Not really. And the reason was because I have a more extroverted personality. And the only way that women were presented, not alhamdulillah by my parents, may Allah bless my parents and my family and all of your parents and families, but in Muslim spaces was often that Khadija radiallahu anha was a supportive wife, which she was. That Fatima radiallahu anha was a supportive daughter and mother, which she was. And Aisha radiallahu anha was a scholar with immense modesty, which she was. But that was all. And to not know their personalities, to not know how they interacted in society, to not understand the roles that they played, made it difficult for me to understand how I can follow their example here in my society with the personality that I have, which I continue to struggle with until this day, thanks to the wonderful Muslim community that I love so much. May Allah bless us all. And I mean that sincerely. May Allah truly bless us all. But I keep hearing this from young women. I keep hearing this from little girls. And the fact that it's still an issue breaks my heart. That so many of us grew up hating ourselves for no reason, literally no reason, other than we were told we were not modest enough for existing. And when we look at Asma bint Umais, she gives us permission in her example to play so many different roles in society and in our homes. Asma bint Umais was the wife of Ja'far, the one who gave that speech to Najashi. The Prophet وسلم, in an earlier time when the Quraysh were dealing with a lot of difficulty without food and Abu Talib, when he had multiple sons to care for, the Prophet وسلم, went to his uncle Abbas and suggested that they both take some of the sons and kind of care for them in their home. And so Ali radiallahu anhu went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to be cared for in the home, financially supported and cared for. And Ja'far radiallahu anhu went to the home of, of, of Abbas radiallahu anhu. Abbas was married to Lubaba, who inshallah Sayyid Amin is going to speak about, Um al-Fadl. And her sister is Asma bint Umais radiallahu anha. Other sisters of Asma bint Umais are Maymuna, who became a mother of the believers, Salma, who was married to Hamza, radiallahu anhuma, and Asma, she's the fourth one. And so she marries Jafar when they're young. And women played a political role in the society of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because she was amongst the very first ones to give bay'ah to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a political act. And then she seeks political asylum in Abyssinia, a political act. And when she is in Abyssinia, growing the community, she had three sons there, along with the small, Muslim, small group of Muslims who were there. All of them were part of the Abyssinian society, impacting the society. 
and an Najashi became Muslim while they were there, radiallahu anhu. They stayed there for 10 years and they impacted the way that Islam began to spread in that part of the world. When finally it was time for them to make hijra to Medina, subhanAllah, and Najashi sees them go onto the boat and he's giving them his goodbye and he says, give my salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And one of the women narrates and she says, I got to give a Najashi salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now they come to Medina. They've made a hijrah from Abyssinia, from Mecca to Abyssinia, and now from Abyssinia to Medina. And when they are in Medina, people are speaking about them. They're speaking about how these people of the boat didn't make, they're not really considered migrants. They're not really considered like the, the migrants that came to Medina from Mecca. And so, Asma radiallahu anha, one time, she is sitting in a room with Hafsa radiallahu anha. And Hafsa is the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the daughter of Umar radiallahu anha. And so Umar walks in and he sees a woman he doesn't recognize. And so he asks his daughter, who is this? And she replies and says, this is Asma bint Umais. And so Umar says, oh, this is the, the, the one from Abyssinia, the one who was on the boat. I love the shift in narration here because initially it's Umar speaking to Hafsa, radiallahu anha. Hadihi, oh, th this one is the one. And then Asma responds and she's like, yes. She takes on the, the conversation. And so, Allah <laughs> and we love him so much, and he's a person of par promised paradise, and so he speaks to her, and he says, we got to Medina before you. Therefore, we have more of a right to the Prophet وسلم, than you do. And this narration is in Bukhari. Asma, when she hears this, she got angry. And then she responded to Umar radiallahu anhu. And when she responded, she didn't say, you're right, you are Umar radiallahu anhu. I, I have nothing to say in front of such a great man, which she could have 100% said and would have been 100% true. Radiallahu anhu. She didn't say, well, I'm a woman and so I shouldn't speak in front of a man. Maybe I should go speak to another man to speak to Umar radiallahu anhu. Like maybe have Jafar speak to Umar radiallahu anhu. She became angry and she responded to Umar anhuma, and she said to him that they had been there with the Prophet وسلم, teaching them and feeding them and helping them and mentoring them and this is a summary of the hadith. And they were far away. And she's like, I swear I'm not going to eat and I'm not going to drink. I'm going to go to the Prophet وسلم, and I'm going to tell him what you said. And so she goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she expresses the conversation with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he gives her the glad tidings that to Umar and his companions, there's not more of a right of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to them than to her and her companions. They made hijrah one time, but Asma and her companions made hijrah twice. This narration was so beloved to the community of the migrants from Abyssinia that Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, who's a great companion of the Prophet وسلم, and the group who came with her, kept coming back and asking her to say the narration over and over again because it made them feel so honored. Also note that the conversation before this narration took place was about how they hadn't been really considered immigrants. That was a cultural conversation happening in the community. Asma radiallahu anha, by speaking up, changed that narrative to then become amongst the highest, the elevated spiritual status to have made hijrah twice with the community. When we use our voice as women, we may not see the outcome in our lifetime but we help shift cultural narrative 
And that's why your voice is so critical for our community, just like Asma radiallahu anha teaches us. Ja'far radiallahu anhu was sent as a flag bearer, as a leader, in the Battle of Mu'ta. And after Zayd ibn al-Haritha was martyred, Ja'far radiallahu anhu was martyred. This was about a year or less from the time they came from Abyssinia into Medina. And so the Prophet وسلم, who it was said, Ja'far radiallahu anhu looked the most like him. This is his cousin. He was so happy when Ja'far came from Abyssinia that he said he wasn't, he wasn't sure what made him happier. The fact that he's seen Ja'far or the fact that they had won the Battle of Khaybar that day. And so when the Prophet وسلم, is informed of the passing of Ja'far or knows about the, the passing of Ja'far he was known as Ja'far al-Tayyar. Al-Tayyar because he lost both of his arms. And so now he doesn't need the arms of us to move. Inshallah, he is considered a martyr in paradise. When the Prophet وسلم, came to the house of Asma, anha, he was emotional and he was overwhelmed as he was hugging and kissing her three boys. And so she asked him, she was afraid to ask him about the news because there might have been news about Ja'far When he confirmed her husband's martyrdom, she was overcome with emotion, just like the Prophet was overcome with emotion. And in this moment, subhanAllah, while the Prophet is affirming the immense loss to the community and his immense personal loss while he is seeing her children and so saddened by the fact that they are now an orphan. While he said to Fatima radiallahu anha that this is a, or, or a summary of what was said that this is certainly a day to be sad, someone to really cry over. He informs Asma radiallahu anha not to scream and tear her clothes. This is such an interesting point. Have you ever heard that women should not go to the grave? Have you ever, have, raise your hand if you have never been to the grave, to a graveyard, to a cemetery. Raise it really high. Let's look around. Women who've never been to a graveyard or cemetery. Okay, raise your hand if you've been told women shouldn't go to the graveyard or to the cemetery. Okay, raise your hand if you have been told you shouldn't even pray the Janazah. All right. In the beginning, in Mecca, the companions, radiallahu anhum, were new in their belief. They were still following or, or learning, still learning about Islam and about the cultural practices that they used to practice not being appropriate anymore. One of those practices was going to the grave, and when they were at the grave, they would call out to the dead. One is they would praise them to the point of almost worship. Two, they would take them as intercessors between them and Allah. Three, they would hire people. Part of their custom was to hire people and specifically women to come to the grave and to basically build up the personality of the person who died. So they could pay someone, a person could pay someone before they died, or pay women specifically because this was especially a part of the pre-Islamic women's culture, to go to the grave and to be the hype people of this dead person. So that the people still living could be like, wow, all the living come from that family? They would become arrogant about who had passed away. So the Prophet ﷺ forbid men and women from going to the grave to protect them from falling into these practices that could lead to calling out to the dead instead of Allah. Once their hearts were firm, once Iman had been strengthened in their hearts, then the Prophet ﷺ changed that ruling and instead ordered and recommended that the believers, men and women, go to the grave, go to the cemetery, because it's an opportunity to remember how short life is. It's an opportunity to think about our own lives and how we are going to live when we're here. And it's an opportunity for grief, to process grief. 
to realize that Allah is the only one who is really with us in these moments. And this is why there's a specific narration of the Prophet وسلم, cursing women who frequent graves, going day and night, every single day, day and night, every single day, obsessively going and not doing anything else and not being able to focus on other things in life, including the responsibility upon your own body. Why? Because this was a practice that was especially common amongst women. That included ripping their clothing and screaming. Asma radiallahu anha had been in Abyssinia. So she had not been in Medina. She had not been in Mecca for many years in which the Prophet وسلم, was teaching fiqh. So in this moment, the Prophet وسلم, despite the fact that he has lost his own cousin whom he loves so much after being apart from him for 10 plus years, despite the fact that he has so much mercy for his, uh, these new orphans, that he is crying and overwhelmed with emotion, despite the fact that he says to the people of Medina to cook food for Asma and her family so that she doesn't have to take, worry about that in this moment. She can focus on her family, her children, and her grief. The Prophet وسلم, respectfully, kindly, lovingly teaches her fiqh. Have you ever been taught fiqh in such a way, in such a moment? Or have you been in the midst of your grief and because you are a woman, have been told you cannot even cry this person that you love is going to hear you crying and they're going to be punished. The immense pain that women experience sometimes in even the biggest spaces of pain is a testament to the strength of your faith. We ask Allah to make us sincere and give us the bat and I didn't give you so many references in what I just mentioned because of the shortness of the time. That discussion is literally an entire hour. But alhamdulillah, I just finished writing a manuscript for a book addressing all these issues related to women. And inshallah, all the sources are going to be in there inshallah in two years when it's published. So, <laughs> inshallah in one year, inshallah. But the point is that we have to rot. We have so much, so much scholarship that has addressed this and why it is and the way it is and the context. Has any of that context been even ever mentioned to any of you when it's been told women shouldn't go to the grave? Where is the context? Context is so critical. Because if we only take one statement, then we can say, oh, the Prophet وسلم, just said this to Asma anha in her pain. We don't know that he was in pain. We don't know that he went to love and support her family, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After Ja'far radiallahu anhu passed away, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu lost his wife, Umm Rumman, the mother of Aisha radiallahu anha. And after the idda of Asma radiallahu anha, Abu Bakr and Asma radiallahu anha got married. And so now she marries Tabarakallah, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And she's pregnant. And they go to make hajj while she's pregnant. And guess what happens? She gives birth on their way to hajj. And so now Abu Bakr who asked the Prophet وسلم, like, what should she do? She's in Nifas now. She is bleeding a particular type of blood that we're not supposed to do salah in. And they're going for hajj. And in Umrah or hajj, there are parts that we need to be in wudu. So what should she do? The Prophet ﷺ doesn't say, oh, she should turn back or we should stay here and no one should go. Or, the Prophet ﷺ just teaches the fiqh of what to do and she continues on the way and makes hajj, the farewell hajj with the Prophet ﷺ. The same hajj in which Aisha anha also got her period and that she shared the fact that she had gotten her period. And now all of the Muslims until the end of time know that Asma radiallahu anha was in postpartum bleeding during Hajj and that Aisha radiallahu anha was in her period during Hajj so that all of us women today when Allah has honored us with something that's so critical for the continuation of humanity that we do not feel like it's something terrible like it's a punishment from Allah like it's something that we need to be ashamed of because it's a natural part of our bodies that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with and we can still go for hajj and umrah even in this state. What a mercy from Allah that he has given these women as examples to us. That we 
have because of their modesty, because of their modesty, we know these stories. Because their modesty meant commitment to Allah. And what better commitment than being so clear about what's happening to you that you can help other women centuries later. When Fatima radiallahu anha was very sick and passing away, Asma radiallahu anha was taking care of her. And as she was taking care of her, Fatima told her that she doesn't like the fact that when a woman passes away, or when she passes away, that the burial shroud kind of shows the shape of her body. And so Asma had seen in Abyssinia that they would build with sticks and with different pieces of nature, kind of like a, like a, not a coffin, but something that would hold the body when it's being delivered from the janaza to the, to the grave. So as Fatima radiallahu anha asked to see what that looked like. And so Asma radiallahu anha built it for her. Fatima saw it, she liked it. And when Fatima passed away, she was taken in this, uh, coffin like box and that was how her body was transported radiallahu anha and it was from Asma radiallahu anha seeing that in Abyssinia and then sharing that with Fatima radiallahu anha but also let's let's take a minute to consider that Fatima radiallahu anha is passing away and her concern is that the shape of her body is going to be noticed after she dies radiallahu anha Yes, we have an obsession about speaking about modesty in our community sometimes, and may Allah bless our community and help us, you know, feel loved in every way. But also on the same end, we speak about hijab in ways that sometimes women in our community feel so hypersexualized that we don't even feel comfortable being women in Muslim spaces completely covered because of the hypersexualization of women in our community. Fatima radiallahu anha, her concern was in connection to Allah. It wasn't a political act. It wasn't about, a, it, it wasn't about a, when sometimes we speak about hijab and we say, oh, you know, I don't be obsessed with the dunya. It wasn't, it was worship. That's all it was. It was worship for her. And as a community, we need to step back, especially considering globally, and consider, are we building the identity of our sisters, helping our sisters feel connected? Because hijab was not revealed until at least 14 years after the beginning of the revelation. Do all of us have 14 years of mentorship by someone like the Prophet Wasallam, where the focus is building our iman and building our individualized personalities and ourselves and our connection and the importance of our contribution before we obsessively speak about hijab? Fatima radiallahu anha saw this as an act of worship, as it is. And so when Asma radiallahu anha is taking care of her body, she was one of three who washed the body of Fatima radiallahu anha, we can see the honor that she gave to her wishes. After Fatima radiallahu anha passed away, Abu Bakr radiallahu anha passed away. And Abu Bakr had stipulated that he wanted Fatima, excuse me, excuse me, Asma to wash his body, not his sons, not Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, the son between Asma and Abu Bakr, or any of his other children, Asma radiallahu anha. She washed the body of the first caliph of Islam, one of the, the best, the, the, the most righteous companion, radiallahu anhu. And after she had washed his body, she came out and she said, today I am fasting and it is a very cold day. Do I need to make a ghusl because I made a ghusl for the person who passed away? And there are two narrations. One says she spoke to a group of muhajirun. Another said she spoke to Uthman radiallahu anhu and Amr radiallahu anhu overheard. And they said, no, you don't. 
She washed the body of her husband. She is in immense grief. And she says she's fasting. And she's wondering, does she need to make whistle despite the fact that she's exhausted and she's emotionally overwhelmed? And it's a freezing cold day. Does she still need to make whistle? The fact that she's considering these issues shows to us that we can be focused on the technicalities of how to practice while still fully embracing all aspects of our pain and our joy and our personalities and who we are internally and externally. She marries Ali radiallahu anhu after Abu Bakr radiallahu And one day, her son Muhammad, the son of Ja'far, gets into an argument with her other son Muhammad, the son of Abu Bakr. And she has two sons with Ali radiallahu anhu. And so they get into an argument of what is like, my father was better than your father. And the other one says, my father is better than your father. And so what does she, Ali radiallahu anhu, say? He says, what did you say to her? And she says, I told them that Jaffa was the best of the youth and that Abu Bakr was the best of the elders. And Ali said, to summarize, he was like, would you leave for me? Radiallahu anhu. In Asma, radiallahu anha, we also see that when she is in grief, subhanAllah, she's still narrating hadith, that she's gone through so much in her life, but she doesn't compromise on who she is. And the Prophet wasallam taught her a dua, or she narrated a dua. And this dua that she narrated, when you say it, when you're afflicted with sadness or depression, when you make this dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will lift it from you. And that dua is, Allahu Rabbi, Allahu Rabbi, la sharika lah. My Lord, Allah is my Lord, my caretaker, my nurturer. And there's no one worthy of worship with him. Allahu Rabbi, la sharika lah. And I'd like to add and say that when you make this dua, if you're going through depression or anxiety, or you are having thoughts of unaliving or anything related, also seek therapy. Because the Prophet ﷺ was there as a mentor. He was there as emotional support for the companions he was teaching du'as to. He himself ﷺ sought support from Umm Salama radiallahu anha, from Khadija radiallahu anha. We have specific narrations of this. So when the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us about du'as that we can say to help us through those times of emotion, it doesn't mean only say this dua and all of a sudden everything's great. Make this dua and also seek support. Maristan is right here. May Allah bless Dr. Anya. And all those involved in trying to support the emotional, overwhelming experience, emotionally overwhelming experiences that many of us may experience. Finally, Asma radiallahu anha teaches us that like the woman companions, we can be shy, or we can be extremely bold. We can be extroverts or introverts or someone in between or a mix of it. We can be housewives and stay-at-home moms, or we can work, or we can be a mix of all. But no matter what, we have a role to play. You were created in this time period, in this space, in this land for a reason. Allah placed you here intentionally. You're not a random person that was born and that's going to die. You are here for a reason. Whether that means you are here to support the next generation of children and grandchildren with the most healing love you can share so that inshallah we can work towards a healed ummah. Or whether that means you are building an institution or working or whatever it means. You have a role to play. And in Asma radiallahu anha, we see that even, unfortunately, when we speak about women, we actively consider her relationship status as what gives her worth. And yet, whether a woman is divorced or a widow or has always been single or married three times, like Asma radiallahu anha, you have worth because of who you are as a believer.
You have worth because of who you are in connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how you use any of those relationships in your life to come closer to him and to help others come back to him. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik nashadu wa na ilaha ila atna astaghfir ka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you so much, Ustada Maryam Amira.